Mirza Yawar Beg uh, on his uh, wonderful journey across the years. Uh, and I think we stopped at uh, uh, his uh, stint with uh, uh, various companies on leadership trainings and all that. Uh, so yes, uh, sir, I see, please continue from where you really left. Uh, that is, uh, you trained a couple of companies, a couple of MNCs. And then how is that? How is the rest of the journey been after that? <laughs> Right, lovely. Thank you very much uh, once again for this opportunity and uh, uh, let's continue this part two of this uh, interview. The uh, Where we left off was uh, around 1994-97 time frame when I was in, uh, when I started my company in Bangalore and my first uh, encounter and stint with GE. I have then been uh, uh, with uh, GE in that sense uh, as a uh, consultant and as a uh, trainer with them to do various programs. I teach uh, GE Croton Mill courses as well as my own courses in GE. I was invited to to um, to design a, a course called PDC, Professional Development Course. Uh, at that time, I was doing a lot of work for GE Medical Systems. In those days, it was a Wipro GE Medical Systems. It was a it was a collaboration with Wipro. So Wipro GE Medical Systems. Um, um, and and uh, so I did a, a huge amount of work for them. Uh, there was uh, Mohan Raja was the uh, head of training at that time, and Mohan and I did uh, a lot of work together. So anyway, the, the, they asked uh, me to design a, a, a program uh, which would be a, a sort of bridge course between the uh, the, the opening course in GE Crotonville and NMDC. The new managers development course. It was, a, it, was, it was people who had joined with maybe two or three years experience and who would become managers in the next two or three years. So that was the uh, window time frame. And I did this, I, I made this course, it was a five day residential program. Those days we used to do these five days, four days courses. Uh, people had more time. So we used to go to a place called uh, Chitballapur uh, yes, yes. on the outskirts of Bangalore, the very nice resort. We used to go there. Um, and uh, we ran the course. The uh, training manager was uh, a lady by the name of Indira Achanta. Again, a wonderful person, uh, wonderful person and a, a very good friend. Uh, so we did all, we did these courses. Then I decided in uh, 1997 that the what I needed was. Um, on-site experience of working in America because um, practically all except for the uh, you know the Australian company I told you and uh, one or two Indian companies the rest of them were all uh, American companies uh, big names IBM Microsoft GE and so on uh, so I decided that what I needed to do was to get uh, on-site experience in America I needed to work in America so I got myself a job in the U.S. and I moved to the U.S. in 1997 uh, with the intention of uh, living in the U.S. and working from here. And I launched my company, Yavarvig and Associates, here uh, in the U.S. Launched in the sense that, you know, meaning I, I was, that was my billing. So you had an LLC and that kind of stuff? No, I was actually working for another company, but okay. I was working through them as, 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 a, as an external, uh, you know, uh, Sort of agent uh, kind of thing. So I, I, I would meaning that uh, they were I would I would source my own business and and, and earn, and uh, uh, that company was uh, would would benefit from that business. So you know it, it was like an independent association kind of thing with them. Um, so I did that and I stayed here until the year 2000. The, re the reason I stayed 1997 2000. My my original idea was to stay here and and to uh, live in the U.S. But at that time, my father uh, was not well, um, and he was in Hyderabad. So in um, in the year 2000, my or 99 actually 1999, my mother wrote me a letter, and she said, "We are two brothers, my brother and myself." Uh, so my mother wrote me a letter say, and said, "We have two sons, and both of us, both of them are not here with us when we need them." Um, and my brother was well settled here, his wife is here, his children are here and everything else. So we decided that uh, it was easier for me to move back. So I 
my wife and I, we moved back to India. We came back to Hyderabad because we said, well, this is a primary responsibility uh, of parents. Many of my American friends were very surprised. My, one of my friends said to me, there, there are no nursing homes in India. There are no uh, old people's homes in India. And why do you have to go? You have come here, you worked so hard and you just about settled yourself. And now you are uprooting everything and going. And he said, what's in India? Do you have a, a client base in India? I said, no. I mean, I'm meaning I've left them, you know, two, three years now and clients don't stay. Uh, so uh, there's no a short client base. Uh, he said, you have a job. I said, I don't have a job. He said, what will you do? How will you eat? So I said, you know what? I mean, the one who feeds me will feed me. That's his job. It's not my job. My yeah. job is, is to do my, what is my responsibility, which is my parents right now. So I'm going. And by the grace of God, when I got back here, one of the big things which I'm very, very uh, pleased about, and I'm very grateful to God, and I'm very grateful to uh, my uh, clients, you know, they, they all become good friends. And uh, I didn't have to do anything. When I came back here, oh, you're back. Very good. Yeah, come, do this work. Do that work. Do that work. So I, <laughs> so I, got, I got work from literally the day I landed. And uh, so there was no, there, there was no, uh, you know, pain period uh, when we moved back uh, from uh, the thing. Interesting anecdote is that uh, we traveled back on the 31st of December, 1999. And that was the day when they were expecting uh, the date change for the millennium. Oh. And you remember those days they said, you know, the, all the COBOL uh, programmers the, got down. The famous Y2K, Y2K problem. Y2K problem. So they said, you know, planes are going to fall out of the sky and uh, all kinds of disasters are going to happen. So I said, well, that's the day to travel because you get the cheapest tickets. <laughs> Nobody wants to travel. <laughs> because we, so the, the benefit was we traveled on that day and, and the, we traveled Emirates and the Emirates guy said, you know, the whole plane is, the whole plane is empty. So I'm going to upgrade you to business class. I said, fantastic. <laughs> we got, we got, <laughs> We got oh. kicked upstairs and we traveled business class on an economy fair. Oh. <laughs> back okay. back in the plane, the plane didn't fall out of the sky. And you survived to tell the tale. <laughs> <laughs> we survived to tell the tale. So anyway, I mean, I think it's a, it was a good thing for all the why all the COBOL uh, uh, COBOL uh, <laughs> programmers. They got a, another short lease of life. <laughs> <laughs> That's very very strange, that you know. People are scared that these systems are written 20, 30 years ago and anything yeah. can happen in the sky. Is <laughs> <laughs> the plane will fall out of the sky? I said, yeah, okay. So <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful experience. Yes. Yeah, so so yeah. anyhow, that we, uh, we came back and then when we, when we got back, we did uh, think about whether we should go back to Bangalore. But then the, the thing was, you know, we came back for my parents and parents are in Hyderabad and they couldn't, obviously they couldn't shift. We have our ancestral home there and so on. So we said, look, I mean, we came back for a reason. We just stay there because it makes no sense. We come back for them and then we, I, I go and live somewhere else. So we just remained in Hyderabad and, um, uh, and that, that, that's now 20 years ago. So it's <laughs> literally exactly 20 years ago. It's like 2020. So we are. And then 20, nice. years, 20 years later, I'm back here. So it's, you take care of your parents. I think uh, that itself pays back in reward. I mean, uh, completely. No, I, yeah. I have no doubt about that. It is their dua. It is their prayers. You know, it is their uh, thing. I have yes, zero. Wonderful. Doubt. Absolutely zero. Because people tell me, you know, you know, if you had stayed here, you would have got U.S. citizenship. This that. I say, yeah, no problem. I mean, I mean what citizenship? I mean, Indian citizenship is good enough as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> now you're a global citizen. You can go anywhere. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, I go anywhere. You know, so it's, uh, true, true. it's been a wonderful thing. What happened, I mean, now the, um, the qualitative difference between uh, pre-2000 and post-2000 was my writing became much more serious from, from post-2000. Uh, because when I got back to Hyderabad, uh, one of the things that a lot of my friends told me, there's a, a wonderful friend of mine here in the U.S. called John Barr. And uh, John John and I, is very, very, he's a very dear friend of mine. And one of the things about John Barr is a very direct person, tells you to your face, you know, what he wants to say, which I, which some people find very disconcerting, but I, I like that. I think it's a, it's a good quality. And you want people to tell you the truth. I mean, I don't want people to talk, uh, talk around the bush. So anyway, one of the things that John told me and uh, something that Carla Fisher also told me, G, and several other people. They said, you know, in the consulting world, if you want to be taken seriously, you must have a book. Uh, it's as simple as that. Otherwise, the you are a trainer. That's a fine. You you know you you'll be a trainer all your life. 
and uh, depends on how long you want to be a trainer, how long you, you want to be standing in front of a classroom. And it, these are different levels. Uh, for example, just to do a very small flashback, in uh, when I was in Bangalore, 94 to 97, there were two uh, areas of consulting, if you want to call it, which were extremely lucrative. One was um, placement consulting, you know, what they used to call headhunting. And the second one was sales training. Now, I deliberately decided not to do both. No sales training I will not do and I will not do placement consulting. Now, a lot of people told me that you're crazy, you are hurting for money, uh, you need the business, but you won't do sales training. Why? I said, because in my view, there is not enough differentiation in sales training. Sales training is sales training. Everybody's doing sales training. So what is my value add to that? Very little. Right? So I'm not going to do, I, I will not do that. I want to be clear. What I'm differentiating has to be unique. It's something that only I can do. Uh, and that's how I want to place myself. So they said, oh, go start. I said, okay. Then they said, what about placement? I mean, you know, people, by then I knew a lot of people and so on and so forth. Uh, he said, I said, look, I want people to trust me. There's no one, there's no living person who trusts a placement consultant, as simple as that. In Bangalore, it was almost a rule that if a placement consultant came, he would not even get past the security guard. You know, forget about anything else. But me, they used to, I would go, I would walk into any company, I would talk to the CEO. One of the things that I'm very um, grateful to Allah for, to grateful to God for, and I'm very uh, happy about is to this date, in 35 years, not a single company ever asked me to sign an NDA agreement, non-disclosure agreement. Not even one. Oh, lovely. I mean, that's no very strange. Complaint. Yeah, very strange. It never happened to me. I mean, I would gladly do it. I've got nothing against it, right? It's standard procedure. But no one ever asked me to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And I take that as a certificate for myself to the level of trust. People trust me. They say, okay, if this guy is here, he will not take our information anywhere. He will not pinch somebody from us and give it to somebody else. And I never do that. I've never done it. And for me, this is a, uh, you know, I consider it something that I'm very grateful for that no one ever asked me to sign a confidentiality agreement because it is given. If, I, if, if I'm the person involved, there will not be a breach of confidentiality. This is something that they have believed and something that I've worked for, alhamdulillah. So I'm very happy that this happened. So this is two things. So now come to come back here, I said I must write a book. Now by then it was about 2002. Uh, 2002, you know what was happening in the financial market and so on and so forth. Uh, things were extremely heated. Markets were way up, and you know the the the, the stock markets in India, uh, Nasdaq, Wall Street. Dot uh, com bust, uh, yeah. Dot com bust yeah. and the market crash. Yeah. Dot, uh, <clears throat> then the dot com bust, and then also the. Uh, subprime crisis, you know, the, the subprime lending for mortgages in America, it broke. Now, before that happened, I had a, I had a bad feeling about this. Uh, I said that, look, this whole market thing is highly unnatural. This, this cannot last. There is no way that you, 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 are, you are pricing things way beyond their actual worth. So somewhere something has to give. So I thought to myself, and I did, and this is one of the things that, which I, uh, I talk about, which is. Uh, Two, two or three things. One is analytical uh, thinking, right? Uh, unemotional analytical thinking. Not a question of what I like, don't like. It's a question of what is the situation. Nobody has uh, has uh, you know uh, future uh, sight. Nobody is a. In fact, I, I like your uh, email uh, tagline, which says, "I will not worry about things that are not in my control. I will only exactly. do what is there in my control." <laughs> Uh, exactly. Very rationally, so, very uh, correct. Yeah, yeah, without, yeah. without being emotional. Yes, no emotion. Be very, very, uh, be very critical with regard to uh, the analysis. So I, critical analysis. Second thing is to have a strategy. So therefore, what? And third thing is to have a structure in your life. Now these are three things which are very, very important, right? Now, um, if you are working for somebody, <laughs> structure gets imposed on you. You know, there is a starting time. A, but if you are working on your own. One of your biggest problems is the freedom. It can be destructive as well as constructive. <laughs> exactly. Destructive as well as constructive. Because, for example, today, if I wanted to sleep all day, there's no one to say anything. Absolutely. Right? But there is a price to pay. So that's, that's for me to decide. Do I want to pay that price? Is it worth that price to, to sleep all day? So that's the thing. 
So anyway, I did this analysis and I thought to myself that when this market crashes, not if it is going to happen, but when it happens, the first thing which will take hit, take a hit is the trading budget. Absolutely. In fact, that's what has happened this year as well. <clears throat> I'm sure it is. Yeah. Because okay. I mean, this is a very foolish thing. Uh, companies try to, within quote, save money on training. Training is never your top expense item anyway. So even if you cut it, it's not going to make any dent in your bottom line as far as the balance sheet is concerned. But, but they just want to do something which makes them feel I'm doing something. So they cut the budget. Second thing is, when people are not occupied, when you have people on the bench, when people are free, that is the best time to train them. They are sitting around doing nothing, train them. Instead of that, they don't do that. They cut the training budget. Then when the market picks up again, now the people are busy, they need the training, but you can't take them off the street. Correct, correct. So it's a very silly thing, but I don't know who to, people just don't understand. So anyhow, so I said, this will happen. Then I said, if that happens, the first one to get hit is me, because that's my, that's my bread and butter. Then I thought to myself, I said, in a company, no matter what happens in the market, whose training will not be affected? Who are the people who will not be affected by the training cut? And who is that? The family of the owner. I said, the owners always want the best for their children. So whether they company makes money, not make money, they will do what is required for their family. So I said, let me see what do I know about family businesses. Fantastic. I think, uh, sir, you just preempted that question. I was about to ask uh, you, oh, oh. how did you come to that family consulting business? You have narrated in a wonderful way. Yeah. Please okay. go ahead. <laughs> now, what I did was, now this is where my note taking, and of course, I'm, I have to, I'm very uh, happy with my memory. So memory plus a note taking, this is where it came into, uh, it helped me. Because my last, my, my tea, um, 10 years in tea, I worked for the Murugappa group, right? So, um, and thanks to the kind of business, I mean, not everybody working for the Murugappa group has this uh, uh, benefit or privilege that I had, uh, which is a personal friendship with many of the family members. But because of tea, you know, all of them go to, the, go to their estates for holidays. Where do they stay with the managers? So you get to make friends with the family members, which normally you would not do because you know you are working for them; they are they are the owners. So uh, you, you may meet meet them in some official company function, but it's never a personal one-to-one -one relationship. But with me, that was the benefit. So they, I've got my my you know among my personal friends is right now M M Mankatachalam, who's uh, uh, who's on the family board, uh, Mr. A uh, M A Alagappan, who was uh, my managing director, and what is very uh, a matter of great pride for me was Mr. A. M. Arunachalam, who is one of the founding members, uh, who is uh, uh, Alagappan's father. Now, A. M. Arunachalam and his wife, Lakshmi Achi, they used to come and stay with us in Nyombadi Estate, which was the rubber estate. And they used to come to go to the Sushindram temple in Kanyakumari. So he would come and stay, would stay with us. Uh, and sometimes they would stay with us for two or three weeks at a time. And, uh, you know, every couple of days they would go to, the driver would take them to Sushindram. Sometimes uh, my wife and I would go, we take a you know, uh, nice uh, outing in uh, Kanyakumari and we'd come back. So now in the house, uh, they are retired people. I mean, he, he, he was not, uh, he was the chairman of the board, but other than that, you know, he was not on a day-to-day -day work basis. So he would, uh, we would, I would take him around the estate. So he's riding with me in the, in the gypsy, come back uh, in the evening, we'd have uh, dinner, we'd sit down, just me, my wife, he and his wife. Now, I told him one day, I said, please tell me about your life. Tell me about, you know, how did the Murugappa group start? Uh, where did you start from? Uh, how come you came into industry? Because these are Chettiar. So, so the traditional uh, business is money lending, right? Uh, so he said, uh, I, so I said, you are Chettiar, you are money lending business. How did you uh, go into manufacturing? Because a big manufacturing company, and right now I think the turnover is around 4 billion or something. So anyhow, so uh, he would talk to me and we had hours and hours of one-on-one of -on -one free time with him, which itself is, I think, a huge privilege because, you know, how many people can go sit to the, sit and talk to the chairman of the, of the, of the company for hours and hours at a time, right? And, and all, all of it. Now, I, with me, one of the things is I have always appreciated these opportunities when they were happening. So for me, it was not time pass. It was, I took that as a, class as as a as a master class in entrepreneurship 
master class in family business, master class in how to run a whole huge business family, right? A master class in how to be the chairman of a multifunctional board. So I, I, and I would sit there with a notebook and I would take notes. Now he also liked it very much. And that talk was worth its weight in gold. <laughs> oh, <laughs> believe me, I mean, yeah, that talk, that's why my, my family business book is dedicated to him. Oh, lovely. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm dedicated to, to Mr. Amar Ratsarab. And the, the, the thing which helped me is I talk, I speak Tamil fluently. Oh. Because I learned Tamil in uh, in the tea gardens. I speak Tamil fluently. Now, Mr. Arnachalam and his wife, both, they were fluent in English. But, you know, people like to talk in their own language. So, okay. when he when he spoke, he used to speak in Tamil. And he knew I, I could speak Tamil fluently. So, we had this whole conversation, practically everything was in Tamil. So, this was a huge learning. Now, that learning, which was in uh, 90, from 90, uh, 91 uh, or 90 to 93, that period, that came to my aid in 2002. Oh, great. <laughs> that, that, out, that gave you enough uh, fodder to write the book? Oh, plenty. Okay. That gave me plenty. And then, of course, I did my research and so on and so forth. You know, what are family businesses? Which are the longest running family businesses? How many generations? Usually, we talk about the three generation syndrome. Father, uh, grandfather sets it up. Father runs it. Uh, son, uh, you know, takes it into the ground. And, and so on and so forth. So, but I said, is that is that a rule? Does, does it have to happen? Short answer, no, it does not have to happen. How to do that? <laughs> Come and ask me in my book and so on and so on. So, all of this stuff, because of the notes, I sat down and from year 2000 onwards, I started writing and uh, then other topics came. I'm interested in wildlife. So I wrote on wildlife. I've written on uh, leadership itself. Uh, you know, I, uh, the book of mine called Leadership is a Personal Choice. Um, so th there's that book. Uh, then uh, because the Islamic uh, studies and so on came into it, uh, we, we established uh, a mosque in uh, Hyderabad in uh, the year 2010, 2009. Uh, so all the the Friday sermons, the lectures, all of this. So writing, writing, and now writing has become a, I mean, I, I write almost on a daily basis. So do you uh, get up early in the morning or late in the night? Like what's your writing schedule? Like how do you avoid, writing, how do you avoid distractions? Yeah, I, two things, uh, Mr. Divakaran. One is I wake up, I wake up at three o'clock, 3 a.m. No matter where I am. Um, so that is my, my wake time. Second thing is that, um, uh, for me, morning is the most productive time. So I, I try to sleep as early as, as I can. Uh, ideally speaking, I sleep at 10 o'clock or 10.30 maximum. Sometimes it gets uh, delayed, but no matter what time I sleep, even if I sleep at midnight, I still get up at 3. So there's no, uh, that, that waking up time doesn't change. Uh, second thing is, I am extremely structured about my day. So even if I'm wasting time, I can tell you, how, this, this is the amount of time I wasted yesterday because I know what, I've, what I'm doing. Uh, there's, there's no time of mind that goes away where I say, oh, you know what, I don't know, I, somehow it went, I don't know, no, I know what happened. Even if I did wrong, I know what I did wrong. So I, I can correct that. I'm very structured. I do not allow any distractions to happen because I don't allow distractions to happen. I mean, I, I'm, when I'm working, I'm working, period. Sh nothing short of an emergency. You know, the house has to catch fire before I can leave it. Uh, but if I'm, and then I am very structured. I, when I go, when I come to my work desk, I dress for work. I never sit, even though it's a, uh, I'm on my own, my computer, uh, I can just sit around in my, in my night clothes, I don't. I get up, I make my bed, uh, I have my, you know, I, I, I do my prayers and stuff, I have my shower, I uh, dress for work, I come and sit at my desk, I take breaks at specific times, uh, I don't eat whenever I want and so on and so forth. Uh, I eat uh, breakfast and then I eat uh, around 4 p.m. and then I don't eat anything until the next morning. Uh, breakfast. So that is also so only nice. twice a day. Only twice a day you eat. Yeah, only time. and okay. uh, only two times. Yeah, and then I have an exercise schedule uh, where no, uh, just uh, so just to walk back uh, the thing. You start your day by three. You said uh, so. What yeah. time do you sit in front of the desk? Is it four or? Uh, uh, so in front of the desk, I come only around uh, nine or so. Ah, okay. Till then, it is all your. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, my yeah, my, my own uh, religious practices, uh, prayer, yeah, and all that yeah, exercise. Uh, yeah, because it, you see that the, one of the things I I, uh, I I realize for myself and I also tell people is uh, you you have to take care of yourself in every way. Your physical activity is important, uh, spiritual activity is important, 
yeah, then your mental activity is important. So reading, writing, and so on and so forth. Yeah, all of these are important. So it's not only one at the expense, but should not, should not be one at the expense of the other. So uh, early first thing in the morning is my spiritual activity, uh, prayers, and you know reading Quran and and so on, uh, dhikr and so forth. And then uh, after that, I you know I do my I have my breakfast and whatnot. They start working, uh, work through the day, uh, and then uh, you know be, I take a break for my uh, physical. I usually uh, I do uh, something some exercises uh, in a gym, uh, which takes me around maybe uh, 45 minutes or so. Some floor yoga exercises plus some gym weights and stuff, and then I go for a walk. Um, I used to walk about four miles a day. Uh, now it's uh, come down to about two miles because suddenly I've, I've developed arthritis in my, in my knees. So it's giving, me a, it's giving me a little bit of trouble. But anyway, let's see. Hopefully, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't think it will become okay, but let's see. Oh, as long as I can keep it uh, keep it going because, because degenerative arthritis is, I mean, the, the doctors tell me that, you know, if you live long enough, you'll get it. So it's not, a, it's not something that uh, will go away. It's something that happens. It's okay. I mean, you know. Uh, I lived without that pain all these years. So, so this uh, exercise, you do it uh, midday, somewhere during the middle of the day? Yeah, or yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Okay. Middle, of, middle of the day. Because okay. also I, I found that time is a time when you, especially if you get, get up very early in the morning, that's a time when you sleep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. At that time, just get out, go for a walk or whatnot. Or, you know, do, so you can't sleep while you are walking. So it's, oh. <laughs> so yeah, it's, wonderful, wonderful. It takes care of that. You come back with you know new energy. And then you, uh, you you restart your day again. So that's uh, true, true. So that's why. Nice. So you actually, how do you? If somebody comes, uh, gives you a call or something, or do you answer them, or it's like all your social stuff is off while you're working? Everything is off. I um, I always answer them. I always answer my emails. I always answer my calls and so on. But I don't just necessarily pick it up when it when it is ringing. Oh, okay. uh, um, yeah. So it, it goes to an answering machine, uh, or there is a missed call. Uh, and then I, I return the call. I always return the call. I mean, you know, it's, I never ignore anything. Uh, but I don't pick up the phone or I don't answer it right then because uh, unless I'm free. I mean, if I'm free, I do it. But usually if, it's, if, if it is in the working time, I'm not free and I do not answer it. I, I, I will call them back. Uh, you know, or, or what I usually do is because if I call them back, they might be busy. So what I do is I send a message saying, uh, sorry, I missed your call. I'm free now. You can call anytime. Okay. okay. Oh, let me know when I can call you back. So then, then that that happens. So how is uh, the book? How did the book lead you to you know consulting, starting a practice on family business consulting? Yeah. Very, so very good. book is a very good uh, you know starting material to start off as a consultant's path, uh, which you said was prompted by your friend uh, Barb, James Barb, John Barb. Oh, John Barb. John yeah. Barb. Okay. Okay. So please uh, uh, elaborate John on Barb that. And, and others. But uh, so they said to me that in consulting, if you want to be taken seriously, then you must write a book. Um, so I said, okay. So the, the, the family business book was, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think that was the first book that I, that I wrote in 2002. So in fact, uh, uh, even today, when you Google family business on Amazon, your book shows up uh, number two or three. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, yeah. There are no other books, uh, not too many books in that category. No, there are not too many. People. The problem people don't write. And also, yeah. if you read my book, my book is probably the only book that deals with the family business, uh, uh, the family business angle uh, with specific reference to South Asian families. Oh, okay, okay. Now, that is very important because South Asians as a group, um, and I'm, I don't mean only India. So this is uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka. And then, um, you know, these people spread everywhere else. So there's a huge uh, people. Now, these people and their business culture is very different from the Western business model. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, there you find your micro niche. Uh, because uh, they have a legacy to leave the uh, wealth for inheritance and all, which is not typically there in the West. It is not. It's not. Correct. Uh, the, first of all, the whole definition of family is different. Yeah. yeah. You know, because in the West, the family is a nuclear family. It's the father, uh, mother and children. Uh, in some cases, even the children may not be included. If they are grown up, they've gone somewhere. That's it. Very nuclear family. Um, Brother-in-law, is he family? Of course not. Right, a mother-in-law is she family? God forbid. 
right? So it's a very <laughs> well in an Indian context, in a South Asian context, you bet. Yeah, here we are talking about generations of wealth, you know, for yes, pote ke pote ke pote ko bhi khilao that kind of khilao, khilao, bilkul khilao. So that is there, and also the expanse of it, you know, absolutely. But yeah. wives, brother-in-laws, uh, son is also somebody. So there is, there are two ways. One is that they are building for a much bigger base. And second thing is that many more people are influencers directly or indirectly in the decision making in that family. So I, I, one of the things that I have addressed in that is the role of women, because that's the other issue. Many uh, or most South Asian families, women in top management, and I'm, I'm, when I'm saying top management, I mean the promoter board, right? Women at that level are non-existent. There's almost nobody. The only women who are, you can literally count them on, on, on the fingers of one hand. And almost all of them are there because there are no brothers to challenge that. So it is an only daughter or some such thing uh, who managed to get there. Otherwise, women are not in the uh, top echelons of business. They are not top decision makers, including the Murugapa family, for example, all men. Although they've got some very highly educated. This is a big, a big paradox because now what's happened is that now meaning over the last maybe 20, 30 years, uh, they have the they have the money to be able to afford education. Those girls are as intelligent, if not more, than their brothers. So they can afford the best colleges and universities. They have the money. They go there. They study. They come back. And when they come back, what happens in the family? They say, "Okay, you take care of the charitable endowments. You take care of the of the charitable schools." She says, "I'm not interested. I want to run the bloody company." No, that's not your. That's not open to you. So you take, so it's literally like saying, go to the kitchen and make, make uh, samosas. You know, I mean, it's not uh, lit. So now there is a lot of turmoil in the family. So I have, I have addressed that in my book. I've, I've said the bedroom and the boardroom. So I said two places where the influence comes and don't believe that just because she's not sitting in the, in the boardroom that she's not influencing your decision making, she is influencing your decision making. So your choice is keep her excluded, treat, treat, treat her like an outsider. And she will still influence your decision making, perhaps not even positively because she doesn't really understand what's going on or include her as a legitimate and a powerful member of your team. And then she will influence it and she will do, she will do a brilliant job. Fantastic. That's what Fantastic. I tell them. Okay. Now, a lot, of the, a lot of the traditional family businesses, this is not, <clears throat> this is not something they, they welcome. You know, I, this, this is part of my advice. They, they, I say, well, you know, you're asking me, I'm telling you, you follow it, don't follow it up to you. But I, this is what I... Uh, believe that the role of women in family businesses is, uh, I think it's uh, hugely underutilized. It is something which should be very strongly emphasized and it's a big resource that they are wasting. So they don't. So this is the, 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 that was the first book I wrote. And then of course, after that, you know, one after the so leadership is a, a personal choice. I wrote that book. Then I was hired. I mean, in GE, one of the things they did was because I was also trained in the um, behavioral interviewing uh, method by GE, uh, and this is one of the one of the uh, brilliant things about GE. Uh, at least used to be at that time, which was a completely abundance mentality. So, for example, when at that time the the head of training in Delhi was uh, another very good friend of mine called Manab Bose. So Manab uh, called me and he said, um, uh, he said, will you come? Uh, will you, are you interested in being uh, accredited and trained for? Uh, for interviewing skills in, in G, uh, by GE and in GE. So I said, sure, of course, I'm, in, I'm interested, but uh, tell me if, I, if I'm uh, accredited by GE in the behavioral interviewing, co interviewing um, technique, uh, am I free to use it for my own uh, personal practice? He said, of course, most welcome, do that. We've got no problem with that. Then he said, also what we want you to do is once you are trained in that, we want to send to you candidates of our senior management to be screened by you before they come to meet any of us. Are you willing to do that? And this is for a fee. I said, sure, fantastic. So there are many GE general managers and upwards who, who I interviewed and gave a report on before they were hired or not hired by GE. Fantastic. Yeah, big abundance, yeah, big abundance mentality. Another thing we Manab, which again Manab did. One day Manab phoned me and he said there is a there is a three-day uh, seminar being run by a person called Dennis Encarnation from Harvard uh, School of Government and Business. Uh, now, he, Dennis Encarnation, even today, if you, if you Google him, uh, is, is Incarnation with an E, Encarnation. 
Dennis Incarnation. Uh, he's an iconic figure, the brilliant man. Uh, so he said this this course is in Singapore, uh, three day three day uh, seminar. Uh, would you be interested? I said, what is it about? He said Dennis is going to talk to us about business and his prognosis of business in uh, the Americas, Europe, and Asia. Right. Um, so then Manav tell me, uh, we G will pay for the fare, your airfare. And uh, GE will pay for you to stay there and to do the course, uh, to do the to attend the seminar. Uh, but we cannot pay you a fee for that. So I said you're crazy. I won't even charge you a fee for that. I, I said you are doing me a favor. So why would I charge you a, charge, charge you a free? Now this was the the the, the later once I asked him. I said you know what did GE get out of this? He said GE what GE got out of it was the the uh, the broadening of your horizons that happened because of that program. So this oh. this is we are. We are doing it for ourselves, but we offer these things to GE partners. You are a GE partner. So you're not the only one we offered it to. We offered it to others, others also. Some others of them came. And now that was one of the most beautiful, most eye-opening seminars that I've ever, ever attended in my life. So this was in Singapore. Uh, Dennis Incarnation is a very strange style of uh, teaching. Uh, in front of the, of the big uh, auditorium, in front, there he had eight flip chart boards. Four on one side of the room, four on one side of the room. For three days, the man literally jogged between these flip charts. He would hold a big, thick marker like this in a stabbing grip, and he would write like this. <laughs> yeah. say, I, mean, I, I noticed because I, I'm a trainer, I noticed all this. So he used to write like this, huge big letters, in a, in a, and it was a chisel tip marker, so the, the, the mark also was a was, you know, flat mark, very easily visible. He would use only black and blue ink, not green or red, because it is not visible from a distance. He would not use any technology, no, no whiteboard, uh, no PowerPoint, no computer, nothing. Just plain white sheets like this, writing like this, and everything out of his head. It was one of the most fantastic uh, seminars that I have ever attended in my life. First day he talked about the about the Americas. Second day he talked about Europe. Third day he talked about uh, Asia. Uh, beautiful stuff. So this was the you know the, the ongoing learning as far as I'm concerned, which uh, which kept uh, happening over the years. So the, the, those books came. Then I, I wrote about uh, thing. Then I wrote about entrepreneurship. I said okay. A lot of people ask me the question like you're asking me. You know, how did you start? How did you get here? So on so on. So I said okay. Let me write that. So I wrote a book called An Entrepreneur's Diary. Yeah, which was really sort of tracing my own uh, starting off as a business startup. Uh, you know, what, what are the dilemmas? What should you do, and so on. So I wrote, uh, I wrote that book also. Uh, so that way, uh, books kept, uh, <laughs> you know, getting. Added uh, just to the, interrupt you, uh, how did the book it. actually lead you to starting a consulting practice in the family business? So basically, book was obviously I, a good. You, uh, you actually took the word out. Literally, the book led me to that. Oh, fantastic! Now, I wrote the, yeah, because the, the way it happened was, uh, I wrote the book. Uh, the book got published was on Amazon. Then one day I get a phone call uh, from. They said uh, today, of course, a very dear friend of mine. But this uh, was in the year, uh, sir. This was in the year 2010. 2000. This was. This was in the year 2000. Uh, probably 2005. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I um, I got this call. Uh, Mr. Rafiq Kasim wants to speak to. So I said, okay. Um, he came online. Uh, he said, my name is Rafiq Kasim. I'm the chairman of Expo Lanka uh, in uh, Colombo. And uh, we have just read your book. My brother, Farooq Kasim, he's on the board of um, yeah, Amana Bank in uh, South Africa. He was in South Africa for a board meeting. He found the book. He liked the book, so he bought five copies uh, because there are four brothers and one cousin. So he said, we bought five copies, he gave the copies to all of us. And we read the book. We liked the book very much. We want to talk to you. Can you please come to and visit us in Colombo? Now, that is how this, so literally the book led, opened the door. And uh, then I went and uh, they are now, that family are very dear friends of mine. We have a long history now of uh, doing all kinds of work for them. And uh, then the book, again, there's another family uh, in, um, which is a very big company. Uh, in the cosmetics business in uh, in Pretoria, Johannesburg area, uh, called Amka Products, A M K A, Amka Products, 
and uh, that family is called Kalas. So they are Kala, the Kala family. Uh, they are all over Africa. So they, 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 but the headquarters is in is in Pretoria. Uh, so then they called me. They said, you know, we, this this book is here. Uh, so can you come then? What they did, they did a wonderful thing. And this is why, you know, one thing leads to another. They, they're beautiful people in the world. Uh, what the Kalas said was, look, uh, you come here, do some work for us. But what we want to do is we want to promote your book. And this is all free. I mean, they're just doing it because they like to do it. I mean, you know, they, so they said, we want to do uh, three uh, seminars on your book. Can you teach a seminar, uh, a one-day seminar on your book? Uh, we do in Johannesburg, in uh, uh, Cape Town, and in Durban. So three major cities. We'll do that. Uh, they host everything. <clears throat> but I teach the seminar for free. Right, and then there is a book signing at the uh, end of that. They actually published the book in uh, South Africa itself, so we had the book signing at that. Um, they said, "Are you? Will you do that?" Now think about this. You know, I can take a view and say, "Look, I am teaching the seminar. This is my business. Uh, why should I teach it free?" But that would be very stupid because I am getting all this huge promotion uh, being done by somebody else. Right, out of the goodness of their heart, why would I charge a fee? I, I said, "No problem. I am happy to do that." So I taught those three seminars. And I got, I think, I mean, pr probably every living businessman in, in South Africa, uh, you know, knows me and knows the knows the book and and so on. Uh, interestingly, on the 15th of October, I've been invited to speak uh, at a family business seminar uh, out of South Africa, out of Cape Town, which is being sponsored by KPMG. Oh, uh, lovely! So KPMG, yeah, KPMG family business uh, wing. They are doing. They they do annual seminar. This time, they have invited me to. Be one of the panel speakers. So this is how the the publicity happens. The book is a a book is a very good way. You know, the, the biggest thing about a book is that condition. We are conditioned to believe the written word. <laughs> so this is a that is a, is a that is the best visiting card you can put out there. Best, absolutely best visiting card. Because yeah. you know, if, if somebody talks to you, okay, they talk to you, they get whatever they get at that point in time. Correct. But uh, in a book, they are getting far more. Uh, they're getting it at their pace. They can read it as, as slowly or as fast as they want. And then they have access to you thereafter. So when you meet them now, even though it's for the first time, like I did with the, uh, Mr. Rafi Kazim, it's not really a first meeting because he's already read the book. Yeah, so now yeah. that meeting is a, is a, is a big value-added meeting, uh, which, you know, this can only do you good. So I think it's... Now, writing a book is not easy. As I'm sure you know, it, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of lot of uh, you know dedication and so on but it is hugely hugely worth the effort there's no doubt about that today publishing also has become very easy because there was a time when you had to go search and find a publisher so on. today self publishing is is almost the norm it is i mean amazon offers it google offers it so many people offer it uh, you can get your book out uh, literally as fast as you want absolutely it, yeah there the middle the middleman is completely out <laughs> completely out completely out and uh, the, the Amazon uh, also pays you a, a much higher royalty than uh, any publisher would pay. Sure. Of course, my, none of my books are within quotes, uh, you know, roy worth royalty in that sense. They will never sell uh, on the New York, on the New York uh, readers reading bestseller list. and correct. yeah, bestseller list. They are not bestseller books, but they're they're, they're your best visiting cards. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They are they are more introductions to what I can do. And consulting visiting cards, they're not bestseller. So it's okay. I mean, I, I, I'm happy with that. Uh, like you said, there is a presence on the internet. Somebody Googles, they find all this. It's a good thing to have. So And they live beyond you also. Like the life of a book is beyond the author. Long, long after, long after, long after. I mean, we are still reading Plato's books. I mean, imagine 2000 years later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> In fact, I just uh, chanced upon you the same way. I just Googled and then found uh, your talks and stuff like that on YouTube. Okay. And yeah. um, I, but you have a very low key presence on LinkedIn, uh, like uh, surprisingly because you're busy with other things. Uh, so I was like, uh, then I started googling your YouTube talks and uh, very very illuminating and interesting talks, and that's how we, I chanced upon this interview as well. Uh, so Thank that's you very much. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, one other question I want to ask you was, how was your uh, journey? Although I think you still might be doing some amount of training, right? Uh, like you still do. So what of training. How was your journey different from a trainer to that of a consultant uh, when you wrote the book and used to get off? Like, what is the kind of hats that you had to wear? Like, obviously, one is, as you said, stand all day long and do a con uh, training gig. And now you sh step into the shoes of a consultant. So 
you know they take you as your trusted partner and then they start revealing your business problems so how is that very different from your other that's a, that's that is a, another excellent question you know the biggest um, uh, the biggest uh, within courts learning curve for me see in a training program uh, it's like uh, making hamburgers right so you are <laughs> you have made the hamburger it's you you give it to the people they like it they eat it they're gone so your responsibility is over with that right you as long as your hamburger tastes good you are you are good to go correct <clears throat> with a consultant is not like that with a consultant there is a ongoing responsibility number one um number two i'm going to change my i've got to sign my face so if you don't mind i'll Yeah, no, absolutely, no problem, no problem. I don't like wearing dark glasses, but uh, so um, with a consultant, there are two major issues in consulting. The first one is that your responsibility continues after you have left the premises of the client, so you you can't just walk away, right? Um, many of the big consulting firms they actually end up doing that because they give you a report and they're gone. Um, they do not. take part in the implementation of what they say and that is a deliberate strategy they don't want to get into that and so forth uh, you know mckinsey will give you a report million dollars uh, billing and and they are happy with that but especially for somebody like me uh, my um, positioning is as uh, your partner long time long term so if i'm positioning myself like that i can't just write a report and go away so that is one thing second thing is in consulting at the end of the day the actual work is done by somebody else which is an internal company employee whether it's the hr person whether it's a line manager whoever but you will be held responsible for that person's work so if i give a recommendation and i say this should be done who will actually do it somebody else and if it fails they will say consultant's recommendation was bad now whether it is fair whether it's unfair i mean of course it is unfair but that is the reality so in consulting you have to think for the other person and the huge focus has to be it's like it's like a football coach for example right now if i'm a football coach uh, how do i say i'm a good coach is when my team wins right there's, there's no other definition for a, go- a good coach is one who team wins correct correct and, absolutely and, yeah and how many coaches actually go kick the ball nobody True. when the actual game is going on where is the coach he is outside the field he is in the stands he may be having a heart attack in the process but he is in the stands he is not kicking the ball he may know exactly what to do but he is not the one doing it and if the goal is not scored who do they blame the coach they say bad coach why because the team lost now Have you ever heard of a coach saying, "You know what? I am a brilliant, beautiful coach. You have got a bunch of losers." No, 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 no. Doesn't work like that. Does not work like that. And with clients, it works even less because if they don't like you, they don't tell you anything. They just go away. True, true. You've lost a client. So when people talk about uh, you know annual uh, performance appraisals, I tell them I get a performance appraisal every day. <laughs> not annually <laughs> and, and okay. my performance appraisal is directly linked to my bottom, to to my uh, pl <coughs> to my pl and account to very right so a client walks away means what it's not a it's not an intellectual exercise a client walks away means piece of bank balance got, bank balance went away so okay. um, the the big challenge therefore was this uh, changing of within quotes hat uh, from a short term to a long term view but what helped me enormously was this whole issue of writing books because because i was writing books i was already thinking long term i was already thinking you know okay here is a training pro i'm i for example i'm doing team working uh, team building programs for example right i did i did a lot of that i designed a lot of that i was one of the pioneers who started the outdoor leadership programs in india you know the the outward bound yeah, courses correct. the course, performance uh, uh, yeah. things and all that correct they yeah. take you so to I a resort know. and make you play yeah, games exactly. and that yeah, kind yeah. of yeah so i i was i was one of the probably one of the first people if not the first person i don't know but definitely one of the first people to start that um but when i'm doing that my focus always was and i would sit with the with the company people with the ceos with the hr people training people and ask them these questions i would ask them what is the system in your company 
to support these people post training right so they are here we are telling them collaborate blah 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 but how is your compensation benefit structured how is that structured does it complement and support teamwork or does it encourage individual competition because if your compensation benefit structure supports individual competition then the training program for teamwork is good only for the trainer not for you because the trainer will get his fee he will walk away and your people are going to come back in the organization they're going to be hugely disappointed they're going to say this training does not work all the stuff that i was taught is a failure and this they will junk it not because the training was bad but because your organizational structure does not support collaborative working your organization uh, structure actually supports internal competition even if the inter internal competition is destructive but inadvertently unknowingly whatever you are supporting that so my thinking always was holistic always was organization wide even though when i was just doing startup training i wasn't using that that knowledge uh, directly but indirectly i had enough of that knowledge uh, so when i um, you know transitioned into consulting and i even now i still do some training because i like doing training i i mean i, I enjoy that you know classroom experience i do that but a lot of my work is consulting because i uh, was able to do that transition from the beginning uh, helping the books helped because that's a conceptualization of learning which is what uh, writing does for you and second thing was that the, the conversations that i would have with people uh, that helped me to uh, understand organizations as uh, as 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 a whole rather than be st uh, stuck in just one piece of training which i am doing i think uh, the point that you raised about uh, creating a competition where uh, culture or uh, promoting a culture where employees fight among themselves for salaries and bonuses and all like the doggy dog world kind of uh, corporate uh, scenario that has actually been seen as an antithesis for growth and these days there is a term called psychological safety wherein people feel free to interact in companies and everybody is rewarded that way the all these hard harvard studies and all are there i think uh, you you bang on on that point wherein you know if you promote that culture that's a sure fire way to take you down the you know rabbit hole of downfall very yes. true no, no doubt about that no doubt because Correct. a lot you know the amount of in, the, the enormous amount of energy that gets wasted in coping with destructive competition that energy can be used in actually creating uh, bigger markets in in uh, building better relations with customers none of that happens because people are too busy uh, you know uh, protecting their own backs from being stabbed or trying to stab somebody else in the back i mean that that's the whole energy is in that correct 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 absolutely so i think uh, one more question sir about your family uh, business thing uh, so you talked about organizational change and organization structure as key to actually businesses doing well so was that the basis of your family business consulting thing or like uh, because it can be a multi pronged strategy do you advise them on finance or strategy or marketing or sales or organization structure so what was your core theme when you went out to consult uh, around which uh, salient features were they based upon you know my uh, consulting uh, family business consulting is based around the central theme of leadership in family businesses number 1 number 2 is succession planning oh fantastic yeah that's a very big problem very big issue with almost all business families uh, of who will take over from whoever is in in the seat now and on what basis you know why why so and so i mean is it only because this is my son or is there some other basis <clears throat> so it is uh, succession planning is another, is another uh, very big uh, issue and then whatever comes uh, along with that now what i do is two things i do one is i start with the family at whatever point they want to start now this is again a very big challenge from a consulting perspective because a consultant like for example a doctor has the benefit of a uh, of a, of perspective and perspective is a function of distance right if i am looking at my palm like this i cannot have perspective if i want to see the lines on my palm i have to hold it at a a certain a certain distance from my from my eyes otherwise i can't see the lines if i'm like this i can't see it now people in the family business the family members they are like this whereas you as a consultant are here so you 
if you are any good at all in your work then you almost by definition will be able to see what is happening in that family more clearly than the family members themselves oh okay yeah, this is a given if you are not seeing that then you are not good in your business as simple as that you, you know you, you if you are good then you will see it number one <clears throat> challenge is first thing you can't tell them that they won't yeah. like it there will be a lot of politics and correct absolutely yeah, they, they will not like it they will not accept it it takes a certain amount of maturity for them to accept it which which almost nobody has so you can i can't go to the the chairman of the company i can't go to the promoter the owner and say you know what i know your family and your issues better than you he is not going to accept that so you yeah. can't say that even though you know that even though even though it is true and maybe even psychologically he hired you because he knows that in his mind but he is not going to accept that and you can't tell him that so that's one thing second thing is that you therefore have to start where he wants you to start so if he says for example if somebody calls you and says uh, we want you to do a uh, comp benefit analysis for us just go do that don't say you know comp benefit is not your problem something else is no even though something else is his problem you just go do what he's telling you to do then oh. you see how you can help him to see what you want him to see fantastic <laughs> once you have yeah but once you have built your Uh, your trust base with them and so on and so forth right? i think Now, this however, this is a valuable piece of advice which works across consulting that don't do the finger pointing right away uh, oh. you don't have any status uh, st- credibility to do that first gain your own credibility and then you yes. be in a position yes. to advise gain your gain your credibility gain your uh, you know I, i believe me this is one lesson i learned the hard way um sure. i was hired and with me was a very dear friend and colleague of mine rosemary vishwanath rose and i were uh, were hired to do uh, a uh, organization uh, diagnosis no actually no we were, we were we were hired to write a uh, personal a personal manual right for personal personal management those days they didn't have the word hr this is called personal management so he said personal management manual for this company now rosemary and myself uh we um we uh, were hired for this thing um now both of us young rose rose is out of i am bangalore <clears throat> so rose and i you know young and, and very uh, energetic and blah blah what not um and this was in the 90s i mean this was before i went out to america and so on so then i was in bangalore so we went now when we went to do this work uh we as part of our design we said we want to interview a cross section of people the ceo was not very happy about the idea but he agreed right so we kind of convinced him as well you got so we now uh, interviewed a whole cross section of people uh, across and what we discovered was not nice because we discovered that basically it was a ceo's stri- ceo style Uh, it was the top management policies which were really horrible and uh, they were creating all kinds of problems uh, in the organization um, so we said look personal manual is nonsense they don't need a personal manual they need to have training to for the ceo to change his style and so on and so on believe me to this day i believe that rosemary's and mine uh, our assessment was 100% correct there was no doubt in my mind that what we had seen and what we suggested was exactly what they needed the mistake we made was we actually said this true so we, <laughs> so we went i can you imagine what happened next <laughs> you can imagine what happened next and that is what happened next yeah <laughs> so both of us were obviously very upset and very hurt and so on then i went to and again you know this is my, the other big learning for me is take feedback go to people and ask so i went to arun gosh who i mentioned in my in the first interview i went to arun joshi arun joshi at that time was head of uh, hr in the rpg group right he was he was vp hr he was director so i went to him i told him arun please give me some advice this is what has happened this is what we did and uh, where did we go wrong arun joshi said to me what i just said to you start with the client where the client wants you to start build credibility then take the client to where you think the client should go he said if you don't do that if you invert it 
you will be 100% right and you will be out on your backside in 5 minutes <laughs> okay. i think this is golden golden piece of advice for all consultants out there no matter no, which no. no matter which field no matter which field really seriously and, and i'm telling you, i learned it the hard way i mean this, this was very painful learning for me and, and and rose when she when she sees this interview she's going to have a big laugh because she will remember this thing i mean it has but very good learning for us start with the client where the clients want you to start then build your credibility because when you have gone there they don't know and this is where also books help now those days i had no books oh okay. right so a book will help you because it's a, the same thing if i do today i can afford to do that because there is a book there is a you know huge base but those days i mean it was not i mean i was as a young guy new person okay so you know they uh, they know zero credibility I mean, they 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 like you enough to give you a job but that's it period true true so that is a, that is a very big very very big learning so this was the uh, when you asked me the transition from trainer to this and as i said for me it's not a, a clear transition not that i never do training i still do because i enjoy it but my main uh, interest is in uh, in the family businesses and that is how also incidentally my interest in education i have i have always been education uh, interested in education i myself had some phenomenally brilliant teachers in my school and later on so i am you know hugely indebted to them uh, for the kind of uh, for the kind of interaction and training and what i learned from them consciously and unconsciously uh, including about how to teach and how to treat children and so on so uh, that also started and i i am a very very strong believer that what we need is very high quality primary and secondary schools because i believe that today the biggest lacuna the biggest gap the biggest problem we have i'm and i'm saying now globally across nations is the lack of ethics and morals and values and compassion and kindness it is not money it is not economy not jobs is not i think it is the lack of ethics and morals and values which include and which begin with compassion and kindness right we are in this literally like you said dog eat dog world uh, we for example if you i, I it's, a, it's, a, it's like a challenge i tell people if i ask you name for me the three most successful people in the world today i can guarantee you that almost every single person will name three billionaires it's everything centered on money everything is centered on money bill yeah. gates jeff bezos uh, you know warren mark buffett mark zuckerberg yeah true or mark zuckerberg right true true right? now my point is what about academicians what about research scientists right what about theologians what about what about uh, for example pope francis right why would you not say that he is one of the most successful people in the world i would say that in fact i chanced upon a similar thought uh, when i was writing an article for one of the agile uh, uh, books so there uh, they talk about the need for a different type of capital now everything should not be in monetary terms capital yes. is also also about integrity compassion human values Absolutely. being human 100%. Uh, 100% i completely agree you know and not only will i say that everything is not money i am saying i have always said this i have said that money is the consequence of what you do money must never be the object of what you do very right. <clears throat> right consequence of what you do so if you are if you have money i am not against money believe me i am not allergic to money i love money like anybody else but my point is that money must come to you in the right way absolutely absolutely now today in america i am sitting here uh three or four billionaires in america today uh, which are you know jeff bezos uh, bill gates uh, zuckerberg uh our tesla guy you know elon musk elon musk uh warren buffett these four five people in this last uh, post uh, covid period their fortunes have boomed whereas in america today the average american is earning far less than his parents earned jobs where i am sitting right now in border of massachusetts and connecticut Mass Mutual, which is one of the biggest employers here, has just uh, cut two thousand jobs. Oh. Now, in the Indian context, two thousand may not be much, but in the American context, it's huge. And especially in this place, which is not—I mean, we are not sitting in New York City, right? So we, the, the the cities here are are Springfield, Massachusetts, and Enfield, Connecticut. These are small cities. Two thousand jobs is major, major, major. 
So they don't have a plan for uh, sustainability or, as you said, alternate no, sources no. of income. True. No, not only that. The next one, which happened just this week, is Raytheon cut fifteen thousand jobs. Oh goodness! Okay. Now, what what do you think happens to what do you think happens to the to the to the communities here? Now, because the whole thinking, as far as billionaires and the capitalist system of multinationals, the, their whole thinking is shareholder focus. Right. One of my very good, very dear friends, T. S. Babu, is a very senior uh, HR uh, professional based out of Hyderabad. He asked me a question actually on LinkedIn and later on he said to me, "Should we be stakeholder focused or should we be shareholder focused? What do you think?" I said to him, "Shareholders are one of the stakeholders of an organization. They should not be the only stakeholders. <laughs> they should not be the they should not be the only focus because it's like it's like stealing from from one child and giving it to another child." you know because you are responsible for all the stakeholders of the organization which includes the society in which that organization lives absolutely i think uh, to, yeah bang on this to... this is also something that i wrote in an article just recently about the fact that companies are trying very hard to please the stakeholders who pumped in money and putting yeah. undue pressure on teams and uh, young people to serve their ulterior motives and working late hours to achieve quick success like you invest yeah. x money they want 5x or 10x in the next 3 or 4 years and you putting uh, put making everybody work in a pressure cooker environment to meet those uh, unrealistic demands of the stakeholders which Absolutely. is your uh, you know shareholders shareholders actually shareholders shareholders yeah you know, and please do send me the articles i would love to read them definitely i will i will send it yeah you know that the thing is that companies must treat all stakeholders equally because for a company to function you need capital i'm not i'm not saying that the people pumping in the capital are not important of course they are important but what about the brains you are pumping in the capital because you're not taking the money and throwing it into the sea right you are taking the money and putting it in a company because you believe that those people in the company their effort will multiply your money absolutely correct if you if you had a different uh, set of people in that company you would not invest in that company correct correct so now that you are investing because of their effort what is the value of their effort true you're putting a huge amount of pressure on them and yeah. expecting things to work for your own advantage in a short time yeah. and then yeah. short circuiting and creating a whole lot of stress i think that's the number one reason why companies are stressed about working for long hours and yeah. the burnout is very high like and also i think you know the re- another another uh, thing mr divakaran is also the the in unwillingness of top management to take the pressure yeah they don't want to pass the buck they just want to push it down the, want, yeah. yeah exactly they don't want to push back onto the board they don't want to push back onto the promoters and say look hold on a second right you got the money you gave us the money very nice but these people have to work and they have to they have to perform you want them you want quality work which means that they need time they need time with their families they need some life quality i'm sorry i am not going to allow that to you to sacrifice that for your benefit i will not let that happen i am the ceo i am the chairman of the board take it or leave it this is how much you are going to get period khalas absolutely i think they are not willing they don't want to do that they want to be nice boys with the promoters with the investors and they want to put pressure on the people down below and if this guy's family gets destroyed his his, his he gets a divorce his children i don't care right you want to die die but die quietly i mean if you want money <laughs> hey this is rubbish and that is what's happening the other thing is also the society is where they live right so for example now you've got a, you you got a company which is based in a in a particular city what about what about the schooling system in that city what about hospitals in that city you are taking advantage of everything right so now what is the payback for that correct absolutely you are not you are part of the society's arm and limb and you should work towards the overall benefit yes. of the society otherwise uh, they will be uh various kinds of cancerous uh, issues in the society definitely very good and i think you use the right word the cancerous issues if the issues which are going to be internal it's not an external threat yeah. internal issues but they will destroy you just like cancer destroys actually uh, brilliant the timing is perfect i just wrote an article about these two things why corona is reminding us to move away from cities and go back to smaller towns and build them they should not be overcrowding in these big cities 
and we should get away. There are some real examples of this, in which I talk in my white paper. I'll share, send you, sir. It's, a, it's yeah, brilliant. Please, please. Yeah, please I think that's a yeah. very good. That's a very good focus. Yes, indeed, they should do that. Correct. And uh, how you can create centers of sustainability with very little investment, and not make people work uh, lose their work life balance, and then the entire young blood of the society is burnt out by the age like they are thirty, thirty five. And like they want to retire and uh, they complete, they don't have energy or any uh, energy left in them to carry on with something. I mean, that's what is happening with people working in startups with the lure of instant uh, glory, uh, gratification and money and you know all of that sort of stuff. I think I think you touched on another very important point, which is this issue of instant instant gratification. I think this is a very big problem. We are uh, not we meaning you and I, but I'm saying the the, the uh, promoters and uh, especially recruiters. They are painting a picture for them, for the young people joining, which is completely unrealistic. Yeah, yeah. There is no way it's not going to happen. They know it's not going to happen, but they will tell them this beautiful story. Oh, this will happen, that will happen, and create. They create these very unrealistic uh, uh, expectations, and then they cannot meet the expectations, uh, and then they create a lot of resentment, a lot of disappointment in the lives of those people. Unnecessary. I think that's also something which is uh, very important, which we should. I, I think we need to get honest with ourselves, you know, and, and get realistic, get honest with ourselves. Yeah. I think this COVID thing is a is a huge blessing in many ways. Absolutely, uh, it has that, taught many businesses many lessons, and it's a lesson for humanity in short, or yes. how to create sustainable economies. And as you said, not just only one part of it, the entire social structure around it, schooling, education, career. And so we're just pulling the system in terms of the marks and the grades. The entire education system needs an overhaul. Because you're gaming the system and trying to get marks, and then uh, not equipping one for life skills, uh, like you know. No, it's not. Yeah. It's not. Even trade, you know, one of the things that I have always strongly advocated, I have said that every school must have a trade school, right? Every child who graduates from school must know some trade which he or she can do with their hands. Absolutely. Whether it's plumbing or electrical work, electrician or carpenter or whatever. And I have said that I don't care. You may be a multi-billionaire. You might say that I, my child will never do plumbing. I don't care if your child will ever do plumbing or not. He must know plumbing. He must know what to do. He must lie down under a sink. He must open the tap. He must flush the toilet. He must know what to do because there is dignity in labor. There is dignity in working with your hands. There is, it gives you a certain focus of achieving results with your hands. And this is a very important part of the life skills training for young people, for students. And it doesn't matter. You you may never use that trade. Doesn't matter. But that gives you a huge part of your learning. Is that? I think and this I is to... this is really fantastic. Sorry to interrupt you. My Hello. wife went on a knowledge uh, exchange program to UK, and uh, there uh, she was supposed to get the skills from a guy who was supposed to leave quit his job after a couple of years, and uh, she he told him that he's going to be a plumber for the rest of his life because uh, he's good at plumbing and. Uh, that pays him far more IT dollars than an IT job. So you said the IT jobs are so boring that you sit all through the day in front of a computer. You get pain in the neck, you get pain in the wrist, and things like that. And uh, he's paid more dollars uh, for his plumbing work uh, in the UK. Uh, he said, "I'm," uh, and as you rightly said, that's a life skill. That uh, you know, after this job, what else? Like you know, you want to do something else? You should have those life skills to equip you with that. And yes. the modern modern education is not never preparing anybody for that actually. Uh, I have a friend here uh, in Massachusetts, in Springfield, uh, who used to work for one of the big um, aircraft companies, uh, defense aircraft companies here, for several years. Engineer, very highly skilled engineer. He used to work for them. Then he left and did two things. He started a restaurant, which his wife runs, and he himself he bought a 16-wheeler truck, and he drives that. He drives that across the country. Right, so he makes a he makes a very good money driving his own 16-wheeler truck, and he says it's a beautiful life. He says I'm I'm going across the United States, I'm seeing all this world, I'm doing this work. I love driving. It's and you know 16-wheeler. My my dream car is a 16-wheeler. Oh. It's a Volvo 16-wheeler. You must be you must go into the cab of one of these things. It's like a it's like being in a spacecraft. Oh, okay. <laughs> the engineering in that is phenomenal. Oh, okay. okay. So he so there, there's this guy now. He's, <laughs> I said oh you. Used to build planes. He said, "No, I wasn't building planes. I was working in a company which built planes." <laughs> <But now I'm... laughs> true, true, true. I think modern education system is lacking uh, the life skills. They only give you degrees 
and except for few uh, vocations like doctor or chartered accountant or a lawyer or uh, uh, like a consultant uh, a lawyer perhaps they can, they are the only ones who fit to you know uh, practice till the end of their uh, life but till the last breath of their life the rest of them as you said once they retire uh, they don't have any life skills uh, worth <laughs> they mentioned nothing, nothing, yeah nothing at all. nothing at all that's that's very sad and then you're too old to you know develop some new skills and uh, yeah, it's uh, no, very it yeah you you i mean you know what you can learn at uh, 60 65 is obviously you it slows you down but you should still try i mean i just correct, enrolled correct. Yeah. for an arabic online arabic course oh, language yeah. course. Correct, correct. So, somebody told me at this age, I said, "Why not? I mean, I'm not dead yet." So, <laughs> but I, but I think you already know a lot of Arabic, right? Uh, perhaps I know, but it. I mean, yeah. I, I just want to get you know get it more, uh, more more formal thing and and polish it and so on. So it's correct, correct. I think uh, learning there is no uh, as long as you're young in the mind, age is just a number, and uh, uh, so it is definitely fine. So I think uh, I've come to the end of uh, the things. So we still have a lot of things that we could discuss, but I think it was brilliant the way the interview has taken. <laughs> Even before I could ask uh, the question, you preemptively uh, uh, took me through your nice, uh, rich, wonderful experience, and I think whoever is watching it, there will be a ton of gold worth of experience in terms of how to be a consultant, how to start with nothing, and then uh, progress iteratively with patience and perseverance, which I think uh, you have shown in great deal of measure. Uh, and um, I think I'll definitely be in touch with you. So thanks a lot, <laughs> sir, and uh, have a great week ahead. And um, I'm grateful to you and uh, for your presence on this uh, channel and the chat. Thank you very much. I am. I am also very grateful to you for this opportunity and. Uh, it is lovely to meet you and i'm sure we will remain in touch and uh, do send me your articles i'd love to read them and sure. uh, let us let us remain uh, in touch